thank you, Albert. Okay, <laughs> so uh, welcome. Thank you, Alberto, for such a warm introduction. I, I miss your energy here, man. It's uh, it's been a while. We miss you, but I'm glad to be able to connect with you and to all the youth in the yeah. area. So again, like I said, Ms. Ranger Izzy, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. That's what I'm here to do. Um, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Clatsa people. Klahauya. And right now we're gonna start with the questions, guys. Yeah, so um, just a little bit about the park um, and, and how I got here before the questions start. Um, Lewis and Clark National Historical Park commemorates the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition to the West Coast. Uh, they did end up wintering here at this location from the winter of 1805 to 1806. And so what we focus on is, is on Fort Clatsop and their time here, which was about 106 days. And I don't know how much rain we get down in the Houston area, but in their 106 days here, 94 of them were raining. So just to imagine that, um, we get back to the questions. I, I can connect those to uh, my personal life and what the winters are here. Um, and so a big part of what we do is we, we get into costume or we do interpretation. Um, I do some education outreach and do education field trips. So we talk about these type of things and we talk about all perspectives that add up to commemorate this story. So really awesome. that's a little bit of park and yeah, here let's we get go. It. All righty. So Izzy, tell us a bit about kind of your background in regards to your, you know, education, high school education, academics, college ed uh, education up to where you are now. Yeah. So um, I went to, so I'm from El Paso, Texas. So on the complete opposite side of the state. Um, I grew up there. I went to school there. My alma mater is uh, Burgess, home of the Mustangs. I uh, went there four years. I graduated in 2013. Uh, while I was there, I played football. I enjoyed my history classes. Um, and I graduated from there to just go on to the local university, the University of Texas at El Paso. UTEP picks up. Um, yeah, while I was there, uh, I had fun. I, I focused my uh, my interest in history, uh, which and then later I would start finding more interest in communication. So with those two uh, tools in hand, I was able to graduate a bachelor's in history and a minor in communication with an emphasis in digital media production. So with those tools, I was able to help myself navigate to the position I'm today. Uh, while I was also at UTEP, I was a part of the RISE, which is the Academic Revival of Indigenous Studies, which uh, definitely helped me put some things in perspective. And it was a big um, part of my life. And I really am proud of that club because of what we were able to accomplish there at the university, which was being able to get the university to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. So um, a group of like six students with the help of some of the student council there really pushed for this. So, so one of the big accomplishments that I was uh, proud of well at, at UTEP. Um, so, but yes, I, I graduated again with a bachelor's in history, no focus. Uh, I just really enjoyed uh, indigenous history, borderland history and Texas history. And of course the digital media production part of the communication minor uh, really interested me because I, I figured that at some point in my career, I would have to make some type of videos or um, have, you know, management of social media and things of that nature. And I did. I ended up doing that and using those tools while here at Lewis and Clark National Historical Park. Um, so soon after college, I worked at Rudy's Barbecue and in the spring of 20. 2018, I was able to apply for Lewis and Clark National Historical Park and was able to get an interview. And that's when I started my career with the Park Service. Some awesome, awesome, Izzy. So I'm going to ask you, are you a first generation um, college graduate? Um, no. Uh, so my aunt had 
had graduated uh, first on my mom's side of the family. On my dad's side of the family, I had cousins that were already graduating. So they were essentially first generation. But but, but your second. parents didn't, didn't attend college? No. Well, my mom did for two years. Um, but she actually joined the park service as well after two years of, of university down at El Paso Community College. Uh, other than that, no. Um, they did not okay. graduate. All righty, thank you. So I'm going to ask you, when did you first think about a career with the National Park Service and what kind of initiatives did you take to help yourself get there? So that actually happened in high school. I was thinking about what career path to take. I was thinking, well, maybe I want to be a culinary chef or maybe I should join the military. But then just talking to my mom, she was telling me about how much fun she had when joining the service and her experiences. I started to think, well, I like history. Um, and I like talking to people about some topics like these. Uh, so maybe I should try to start getting on my path there. And it's, some, it's something that's stuck. And I continued to pursue that through university and I'm lucky enough to have uh, achieved that goal. Mm -hmm. So I know you did a lot of volunteer work at El Chamisal and things like that. Can you talk to us about that and maybe around how many hours you had and what you had in mind when you were doing that? Okay, so uh, the volunteer experience at Chamisal National Memorial was, was fun. Uh, I think that it was a very impactful part of my life and career in the Park Service. That was the first time I was going to be able to learn the operations of working a visitor center, the operations of working for the government, the operations working for the Park Service. So um, not necessarily knowing what I was getting myself into, I was able to go applied to be a volunteer and I was very very fortunate to have uh, been paired with a ranger there at the time his name was uh, Adley Olivares he's my one of my best friends he's um, the godparents to my kids he's just very close to me and I can go to him for anything I need in the service uh, but he showed me the way to navigate through being a um, volunteer and learning the skills at Chamisag and so being able to help with small programs to bigger, large summer programs like Music Under the Stars, which saw maybe about 3,000, 4,000 people in one night and being crowd control, it was, uh, very, uh, it was very rewarding. So you definitely found a mentor in him. He kind of took you under his wing, showed you, you know, the ropes and, and things like that. So that's kind of what we kind of encourage our students to do, regardless of the career that they pursue, right? Maybe they're interested in a certain field, go volunteer in that field, right? See what it's like and see if you can find mentors, right? Yes, of course. And, and it's really good to find someone that you're relatable to because everyone's situation is different. Everyone's story is different. And when you find someone that has similar um, life experiences as you, it just makes it much more worthwhile and gives you some more motivation to, to get through and to do these, these career paths and, um, and these uh, steps to get there. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. So my next question for you is, what is the application process like for the National Park Service? <laughs> it's tedious. It's very tedious. Uh, Zachary is here uh, laughing behind the camera. Um, uh, at, when entering the any government job, um, in particular the Park Service here, you have to go on usajobs.gov. Go there, create a profile, and then fill out your information about where you live, um, then you have to build a resume. They help you on that site to have a resume builder. Um, I did not do that. I had help from my mentor who let me mirror his resume to build mine off of. And so um, you have to detail your resume to everything you know, your skills. That way you can be the best candidate for the position you want. Once you have your profile and resume up on the website, you can then look for uh, specific jobs you want. So there's a search bar that has uh, all the agencies in the government. You would type in NPS, or if I was looking for education technician, I would maybe put that as well. Uh, but NPS is your best shot if you're applying for the park service and look at the different jobs listed. Um, it'll have a job description when the availability of uh, 
resumes will be submitted, the time of the job and where it's going to be. Uh, definitely has other details on that application form as well. But uh, read through that, you look to see if you qualify, you see you do, you apply, you answer questionnaires and then you will submit all your documents, then the assessment and you will then submit your application and then hope that somebody contacts you in about a month um uh it's you know send as many as you can because you're not you're not sure exactly who will contact you but if you do get contacted the interview between different parks i've found is very rewarding in knowing what people are looking for and what skills that you have can reflect on that. So you can um, definitely add some of these things to your resume and just know how to interview very well for these mm -hmm. positions. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Thank you for that, that answer. Um, so what, let's get more into your job, right? What does a typical day look like for you? Even right now in the summer, what does that look like for you as an education technician in the National Park Service? So um, it's very, it, it varies every day. Uh, for us, we are a very flexible team. Um, the, what we have just started here at Lewis and Clark is our summer programs. And that includes doing third person interpretation at the Fort Reconstruction sites. And what we do is we have these nice and funny, cool costumes that we get to dress in. So this is a enlisted men's jacket that one of us would be wearing out at the fort if we're, uh, or for um, um, programs to help, or no, uh, ceremonies to get people their citizenship. So these are just some nice uh, clothing that we can wear. We have props out as well, historical props like this. This is a Clatsop woven cedar hat. And we are able to take these out and talk about these the significance they are to the local people here um, and then how they're made and the cultural significance. Of course, we just have these nice, uh, fun, uh, tangible uh, props to pass out to the public as well. So we try to be as very engaging to our audiences here to bring history to life here at Fort Clatsop. Um, and other days um, this past school year, uh, we've been doing things like this and showing the same objects on camera and connecting with our kids, our students out uh, in the local area or in the wider uh, community in the United States. And I know you get to be on kayaks too. So you actually do interpretive programs on kayaks on the river, right? Yes, yes. Um, I actually have my first kayak program on Monday. Um, and, and that's such a fun time. Um, Alberto has actually led one and I was a safety officer when he was here. Um, and yes, we take groups of uh, people out on the water and we're able to do these interpretive programs on water and um, get to share those experiences there. And mm -hmm. it, um, what's really cool is the challenge that comes with it. Um, we don't get to take these props out. So bring, having to be very strategic in how we bring the stores to life uh, it's just part of the fun. So I like that you say bringing stories to life. So in your position, that's what you're trying to do, right? Storytelling, make it engaging, uh, engaging, interactive for the public. So as an education technician, that's what you're doing, right? Educating people. But let's say for students who want to major maybe in biology or want to major in something else, what other kinds of things or, you know, career paths does the National Park Service bring? is such a good um, question to follow up with. Um, yes, I did have a history degree um, and there's other people in the service here at this park that have biology degrees, that have engineering degrees and they work in different divisions. Uh, we have separate divisions here at the park, but we're all a big team. We just do different tasks. Uh, one of those divisions is our resource divisions. So people who are wanting to work with their hands out and with the plants, all the animals, knowing what to do next for the best of the natural spaces we are here in the park. Um, with that, there's also cultural resource to help navigate through any digs that might happen in the park, like let's say a septic tank <laughs> upgrade. They need to make sure that they're not digging into anything sensitive in the ground. And of 
course, we do have our facilities management, which helps us with the heavy duty stuff like fixing trails, fixing our public restrooms and supporting the team with our facility needs. So, and there is also law enforcement officers as well, right? For the national parks, depending on what park you, you work. Yes, yes. Uh, I did not mention law enforcement because here at Lewis and Clark, we don't have law enforcement. We used to, but because we're such a small park, um, they decided it wasn't worth having them here. But yes, mm -hmm. bigger parks, law enforcement is, um, is big to have because it's just such a big space and to help help people navigate through what they need to do is, um, is something that the service, uh, depending on the park. Right. So the National Park Service, again, it's, it's a huge thing. And we have parks like Lewis and Clark National Historical Park. Could you name other parks around the country? Oof. Um, yes, I can. We got Big Bend National Park, White Sands National Park, Yellowstone, uh, Santa Monica Mountains Recreations, Glacier National Park, Olympic National Park, Mount Rainier, Fort Vancouver National Historic Park. Ooh, there's there's so many. Um, within, within I felt like that. Sorry. <laughs> Within the national park, there's just so many options, right? If you want to go be a biologist at Mount Rainier National Park or at Yellowstone National Park, you can make that happen, right? Definitely, definitely. If you feel like that's going to be the best fit for you, pursue it. Um, and you can get on for one season, see how you like. A season lasts about six months. If you like it, continue. If you want to move to another park to see what that operation is like, do so. But if you jump into this career, uh, you will you will learn so much and you will gain so much perspective um, in the different workplaces. Can I jump in, Ranger Izzy? Of course. What do you, what do you have to add? Hey, to students, that? this is Ranger Zachary behind the camera. I just want to go off of that and say that even within the different divisions in uh, in the Park Service, there's so many specialized jobs within those divisions. Mm -hmm. Like you could be an archaeologist. You could be a special investigator. You could be an administrative assistant. You could be a lawyer. Um, you could be a soil and water conservation specialist. Like the, it's really endless. If you think, you know, right now you already know exactly what you want to do for a living. There's probably a job you can do that at in the national park service. And then you get to do that great work in one of the most amazing natural or cultural spaces that our country preserves. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you for adding that Ranger Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was really you guys, again, there's so many things that you can do. You just named the archaeologist if you want to work, you know, with different types of things. There's definitely um, just so many things out there. So I'm going to say, how would you describe the individuals who work in the National Park Service? And can you explain the overall culture at your park? Yeah, so, of course, everyone comes from different backgrounds. Um, everyone's different. Everyone brings a different energy to the Park Service. That's what makes us very unique. Here at Lewis and Clark National Historical Park, I could not say anything negative about the people we work with. We have such a great cooperating team and we come every day with that a positive attitude to help each other. Uh, like Ranger Zachary right now, he is helping me with this interview right now. Um, he's holding cameras, being an awesome uh, person behind making sure that technology is working, adding to this interview. Um, of course, I would do the same for him. Um, other people in the park would rally around each other if something is wrong. And we work together to find solutions. We hear each other's opinions. Um, it's a very, um, very positive culture here at our park. Great, great, great. So what type of training were you offered by the National Park Service to prepare you for your job? Well, that's, that's hard to say. Um, for the, the, the position I'm in right now, um, I did not necessarily have specific training, but when you're working in any position you are and you have an opportunity to help a team do something, take those opportunities because you learn those skills. This morning, uh, the education team was invited to go help the resource division helped uh, take invasive species out of a uh, plots of ancestral land that they had just regained. 
And so we went down there and we were assisting for as long as we could. And that's not something we would normally do, but we had the opportunity to go do so. And now we know how to properly use the tools to, and to see what the type of tools resources use on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Ranger, is, do you want to talk about your leadership program you just got into? Oh, yeah. So um, one thing that just happened to me yesterday, um, I got accepted to a leadership revolution program that's going to 40 weeks, three hours a week. And that's going to help me uh, gain better perspective of being a leader, uh, hone better skills in being a leader, and just be developmentally ready for any situations in the workplace. Uh, so that's something I'm very excited to do. Um, and it's this training that's offered with the Park Service overall, and there's more to come, uh, but something specific like that is definitely um, something that can help build the person you would be in the service. And I know personally one that, that you know, they call it training, but it's super fun is the one on the kayaks, right? So being on the kayaks, you're delivering an interpretive program, but what do you do if someone flips over, right? What if someone capsizes, then you're in trouble. Can you talk to us a bit about how you guys are trained um, during that? Well, the first thing that popped into my mind when you said that was in our training, when we were out on the Columbia River and they had instructed myself and somebody else to flip your boat over because you're trying to save us. And that was just such a good moment. But uh, we, um, we go through this training every so often so we can have our rangers who are on the water be ready to help anyone who does flip over into the water uh, we're very fortunate not to have a very fast current uh, river here um, but nonetheless um, it does scare people if they do fall in and we're just ready to be physically present and emotionally present to save that person uh, train their kayak and flip a, flip it over to get them back in or on shore Right. So, yeah, you're trained basically, you know, how to empty, you know, water out of kayaks, how to, you know, help people calm down in case they do capsize and really just how to handle the whole situation. Awesome. Awesome. So what is your absolute favorite interpretive program and why? Hmm. Favorite. That's, uh, you know, I, I've been really doing a single program lately and I feel like I've mastered it pretty well but it's my trade talk my trade program that I do here um, it's very um, you know it's very I, I think it's got a lot of perspective in it um, I talk about the Lewis and Clark expedition but I also talk about the indigenous people here um, that up so that when visitors come they can imagine like whoa, this is what it would have probably looked like when the Lewis and Clark expedition paddled into the lower Columbia and mm -hmm. how the experience between the two and how um, just how the trade interaction went and how important it was for the core here and how trade is such a big um, role in the lower Columbia. So I, I would have to say my trade talk. Awesome. So a trade talk. And it's pretty cool because with these kinds of interpretive programs, as, as an education technician, you can kind of choose, right, and get creative. Like, hey, I want to talk about this. I want to bring this story to life. I'm going to do that one. Right. Oh, yes. I'm, going to I'm going to stick to this. Like if I want to talk about, um, you know, the Western Red Cedar and incorporate it into my program, you can go ahead and do that. So how would you say, is there a good amount of freedom um, in creating your own interpretive programs and bringing certain stories you want to life? So yes, that's one thing I have found here at the park that I work at. Um, our supervisors give us uh, the freedom to pick our topics. As long as it relates to the story here, they don't mind what you talk about. As long as it's on topic, has themes, the objectives and goals, um, we're pretty much free range to do the talks we want to do. Um, and there's different variations. Um, I started a, plant, a medicinal plant program for um, me to eventually create, but even Ranger Zachary has his own medicine program. And so although they're the same topics, they're completely different and there's different perspective. And it's just really nice to have variety and supervisors that welcome that, um, that variety of programs into the park. 
Awesome. That's great. So a lot of creativity and things like that into this position. I know that you are passionate about creating a diverse workplace in the National Park Service. Why is that important to you? Oh, man, it goes back to saying the, how people from different backgrounds come together to create a awesome dynamic workforce here. Um, it's important to me because it gives people like me opportunities to come out and give my opinion and give my perspective on telling a story, just like it would Ranger Zachary or just like it would Ranger Kathy Peterson um, and all the other great Rangers here. Um, because if we had the same Ranger coming over to having the same stories over and over, I think it'd be a little bit boring. But having that diverse workplace makes it worthwhile. It's a great learning experience. And, you know, I, you know, I, lo I love the people I work with. Yeah. So, and you guys also have visitors from all over the world that visit you guys, right, at, at this park. Um, around how many visitors a year, if you have that stat, would you say that you guys kind of have? Um, well, for years. So we're talking about people from cruise ships coming on their own. We are definitely in, the, I would say, maybe over 40,000, 50,000 yeah. a year. Uh, alone in education, we hit 8,000 students. So we are seeing people come again from different countries, different states, different communities. And it's just, uh, it's really nice to see. And that's just people we see in our visitor center. That doesn't count our trails because mm -hmm. I'm sure people get out and run and then they, um, and then they leave because maybe that's trails. And it's seasonal. And it's seasonal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alrighty. So finally, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be a park ranger in the National Park Service or who wants to just maybe be a part of the National Park Service in, in whatever career? Oh, yeah. So um, my advice, um, I would say get out to your your uh, local park. And I could even say even try in your state parks, because I know in Texas, there's not that many national parks. Uh, there might be different uh, reserves or uh, national bases. That I know there's many state parks. But getting into any of those park um, park cultures, learning the operations, learning how to put programs together, or just talking to people are just skills that are important to to just have. And some of you might have those already, um, but go volunteer. Have a mentor that is going to be able to answer any questions, talk to supervisors, talk to rangers, talk to other volunteers, um, get into the community there, learn as much as you can. And of course, study up on where, wherever you go, uh, get your degree and you can definitely get yourself a career into the park service. Um, it's, uh, it's very rewarding. And I, I love the career path I chose. Awesome. That's great. Great. So get, get your foot in the door by volunteering at your local parks. We do have Brazos Bend State Park. You know, there's a lot of alligators there. If you guys haven't visited, there's other ones, you know, around here in the Houston area. So that is something you guys, you know, should probably do. If, even if you're interested in going to the state park route or you're interested in going to the National Park Service route. So build your network. Yes. Thank you, Kathy for adding that in. So that concludes my question, students. I'm gonna open it up for questions now. So start typing those in and I'll stop.